Hello, everybody, and welcome to an update on a lecture I gave almost a whole decade ago on malabsorption. Very, very, very common thing to run into on step two and step three, and also obviously in the clinic. We're going to get acquainted with some of the most common causes of malabsorption, as well as how it presents and, uh, and sort of how you can suspect this and, and work it up. All right. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get. And I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. I very much appreciate it. Okay. So, um, diarrhea due to malabsorption. Naturally, malabsorption, where you're not absorbing fat, is going to cause diarrhea. Fat is going to cause you to retain water in the colon, and you're going to get that greasy, bulky diarrhea that does not uh, flush down the toilet. So it really is just a malabsorption of fat, but by extension, you're going to have a malabsorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And so that can cause some symptoms if this goes on long enough. And indeed, uh, we do see symptoms occasionally, especially in children who have malabsorption. There are a lot of causes, celiac disease being uh, one of the more prominent causes just because it's so common. Uh, we also have to think of chronic pancreatitis, tropical sprue and Whipple's disease, um, and then cystic fibrosis, especially in kids. What are the symptoms? So the patient is going to notice the diarrhea, obviously, um, and it's a steatorrhea. So it's a fatty, greasy, bulky diarrhea that does not flush down the toilet. They may have signs of vitamins D and K deficiencies, so that would be hypocalcemia and increased prothrombin time, i.e. they're bleeding more. And certainly they can have signs of weight loss. If you're not absorbing fat, you're not pulling in the calories. You know, you go and eat a burger, it's 800 calories. Well, if you're not absorbing the fat, that 800 calorie burger is only about 400 calories. So, uh, you know, you can see how it can become very easy to lose weight very quickly. To diagnose malabsorption, it's as simple as getting a, uh, a fecal fat test. So you get a stool sample and, um, and you'll find fecal fat. Uh, so that should always be your first step when you're working a patient up for diarrhea or you're working them up for um, anything where you suspect that they're not absorbing the fat properly. You suspect a malabsorption. Now, what is celiac disease? It's an autoimmune inflammatory response to gliadin, which is a component of wheat and grain products, and it's one of the more common causes of malabsorption in otherwise healthy people. So what happens is that these antibodies create inflammation and damage to the small intestinal mucosa. Uh, just because of the allergic response, you get this collateral damage, and it results in malabsorption. The way that these patients typically present is they say, I got this bloating, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, and it goes on for a long time. And some of them think they're lactose intolerant, and they cut the milk out, and it does not improve. Uh, so they may also have anemic features just due to the malabsorption, and so they can have pallor and fatigue, also due to the chronic inflammation. Certainly, they're going to have the chronic diarrhea, which is greasy, of weight loss, and then they can get this uh, this dermatologic manifestation called dermatitis herpetiformis. I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Now, remember that the small intestine absorbs iron. So these patients are going to tend to be anemic, not only because of the chronic inflammation, but because of the difficulty in absorbing iron. This is dermatitis herpetiformis here. You can see it does have a herpes-like appearance, a uh, very pustular, papular appearance, um, tends to be on the extensor surfaces. The best initial test when you suspect celiac disease is to get serology. So you're going to get anti-gliadin, anti-endomesial, and anti-TTG antibodies. If those come back positive, uh, then what you need to do then is get a small bowel biopsy. And that's because we're looking for the possibility of pre-malignancy uh, of lymphoma. And we really also, also want to ultimately confirm the diagnosis. The small bowel biopsy is the most accurate test. The treatment is a gluten-free diet. Um, now, you can go ahead, uh, even if you don't do the 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 
confirmatory tests. You can put them on a gluten-free diet. If their symptoms get better, you basically have a confirmation from that. Now, gluten-free diet sounds easy, but it's really not. This is not just, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to have, uh, I, I'm going to not have bread with my sandwich and instead I'm going to put it in a lettuce wrap or something. There are things even like sauces that have gluten, and it's very difficult. I have a friend who's got celiac disease. It is not easy. You got to keep the kitchen decontaminated. It's 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 hard work. Um, so fortunately, there are a lot more options for these people. Chronic pancreatitis is due to permanent damage uh, to the pancreas, usually due to repeat insults from alcohol. However, it can be idiopathic. Remember, the pancreas provides enzymes that are responsible for breaking fat down. If we're unable to break fat down, we're unable to absorb it, and so you have a malabsorption. These patients, uh, again, they're going to have similar features uh, ex uh, to celiac, except for you don't have inflammation in the intestine. So they're, they're able to absorb iron, but they're less able to absorb fat. And so they're going to have the weight loss. They're going to have the steatorrhea, the diarrhea, and they'll have a history of repeat episodes of acute pancreatitis that will be given to you in the history. Uh, to diagnose this, a lot of people say amylase and lipase, and that's not reliable for chronic pancreatitis. It's good for acute, but it's not reliable for chronic pancreatitis. So what do we do here? We just get good old imaging, CT or an abdominal plane film, and you should be able to see pancreatic calcifications in about half of patients. But otherwise, this is going to have to be a clinical diagnosis. The treatment is pancreatic enzyme supplementation, as well as supplementation of fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, those are A, D, E, and K. And remember, if we're doing anything for these patients, we need to make sure that we're treating underlying causes. That includes alcoholism. So if refer them to an alcohol treatment center and make sure that they're getting supplemental B12 and thiamine. Okay, those tend to be B vitamins tend to be deficient in alcoholics. This is what you can see with chronic pancreatitis. Unfortunately, my stuff is black here, so I can't really point, but you can see the calcifications. Other causes include tropical sprue. Exact cause is unknown, very, very rare. May come up on step one, unlikely on step two or three. The diagnosis here is very similar to celiac disease. Um, remember, celiac disease is also called celiac sprue. So it's a similar sort of pathology picture. The diagnosis here is via small bowel biopsy. We treat this with antibiotics. Uh, either Bactrim or doxycycline. Whipple's disease is due to T. Whippelli. It's a pathogen. Contrary to popular belief, it does not require travel outside the U.S., but it is very rare. The diagnosis, again, here is small bowel biopsy. Uh, it'll show these PAS-positive foamy macrophages. This is a step one thing here, though. Again, treatment is with Bactrim or doxycycline. Cystic fibrosis will probably be given to you in a different way, um, usually a child with repeated pulmonary infections. Um, however, you could get it in the context of a GI case uh, in which you would have malabsorption and steatorrhea. Uh, these patients are deficient in pancreatic enzymes. They're unable, they're unable to get those pancreatic enzymes into the intestine, rather. Uh, so look for a child, two, three years old, failure to thrive, thin, um, all the typical signs of cystic fibrosis, they're salty and they're sweaty and they have had 10 pneumonia cases and for some reason it hasn't gotten diagnosed yet and now they've got diarrhea. The diagnosis for cystic fibrosis is a sweat chloride test. The treatment is pancreatic enzyme supplementation for their GI issues. Uh, however, because we test for cystic fibrosis so early on and so commonly, uh, this probably won't present to you as a malabsorption case, but just know that it can happen.